presentation of my colleague and friend, Alexander Witzmann, the senior advisor to CEP, who also works incidentally with the RAN network, the radicalization network in the European Union. And um, Alexander has written a couple of papers that you saw linked in the invitation. Uh, 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 he was responsible for our test on how the notice and takedown system works in NetCG and also a smaller policy brief on transparency requirements. Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you. Perfect. These were very um, insightful presentations by my colleagues. So I can really focus on um, the, the research that we did in Germany on the Nets DG. The Nets DG maybe as a test case for a lot of things that are uh, happening, that are supposed to happen in the TCO or partially in the DSA. Um, so I'll be speaking a focus with a focus on automated content moderation and lessons learned from the test case NetsDG, the Network Enforcement Act. Um, I highlight some of the key findings and then give some recommendations for our European colleagues on how, how what, what could be learned from this experience. So the, the Germans uh, two years ago implemented a law because um, a lot of hate speech and terrorist content was found online. There was a test run by Jugendschutz.net, an agency commissioned by the Federal Ministry of Justice to check if when reported that hate speech or illegal content is being taken down. And the numbers were so bad that um, the Bundestag, uh, the German parliament and uh, the government uh, decided a law needs to be passed to make sure that the laws that are of course uh, um, being implemented offline in the real world, uh, so to say, also apply online on the platforms. And there were some requirements, so there were no additional um, um, crimes or, or anything in that regard added. It was just making sure that a compliance system, an effective compliance system, has to be established by platforms that have more than 2 million users in Germany. Um, then there was uh, the condition that uh, social media companies need to remove illegal content once uh, they are aware of it within 24 hours. And that's mostly manifestly illegal content. What that is, is up to a discussion to a degree, but we will talk about that later. And if it's very broad going into hate speech category, they usually have seven days to do that. Um, as I mentioned, two million uh, users need to be registered on the platform for, that, for the law to be effective. So in Germany, we have the situation that the government uh, at some point bans terrorist organizations. That, that those bans usually include that the logos, the, the, the flags, uh, the symbols of these organizations cannot be shown in public, unless for educational, artistic, or for media reporting context, of course. So it is illegal, for example, to show the flag of the Islamic State or the swastika of the NSDAP in public unless, right, there's a conditionality to it. So what we did in our stress test, a sample analysis, uh, because we wanted to see does the NetsDG work at all, because in the current discussion about amending it, the assumption was it works, it just needs to get better. And we wanted to check the basic assumptions, the theory of change behind it. Do we really achieve what, what is being uh, supposed to be achieved? So within two weeks, we uh, looked into YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, just basic uh, hands-on research like you would do it uh, with no um, um, AI or machine learning uh, software as a helper. So um, we found and reported 92 um, mostly videos um, that uh, were, could be classified as manifestly illegal content because they were showing propaganda of banned organizations, showing the banned logo. So this is really, this is not about, uh, is this freedom of opinion? And it was uploaded by the organization itself or by supporters. So it was not media reporting or any other content. And uh, it turned out that um, the removal rate of those manifestly illegal uh, data pieces was just 43.5%. Uh, um, On YouTube, it was even worse. Just uh, a little more than a third of the videos were blocked under NetsDG after we found and reported them. Facebook uh, blocked what we reported to them, um, but found uh, or other illegal content that was in the same uh, folder stayed, and I'll explain a little bit what this means. And Instagram 
after taking a little bit more time than they should have simply deleted everything. So they didn't go after NetsDG, they just uh, deleted everything after their community standard. So a very a not encouraging uh, findings here in terms of NetsDG. So the case study I will uh, share with you, there's an organization, it's called Die Wahre Religion, so translate the true religion. And they were, as you have heard about it, maybe they were handing out Korans in public and they were doing dawah, preaching and recruiting, which is but per se not a problem. But this was an organization that saw about 140 supporters from Germany uh, join uh, Islamist jihadist organizations, Islamic State and others. So the most successful organization in quotes in terms of terrorism in Germany for a long time. We found 80 videos. We found actually 3,000, but we reported 80 videos to YouTube saying, uh, you guys look at this, this is illegal. Here's the ban order, um, please take this down. The videos we found had about 18 million views um, and we didn't report all the 3,000 because we were just looking into the mechanism and it would have taken a very long time for us. So this was a very targeted research checking the mechanism. So this is then um, how this is uh, supposed to look like almost. Um, you see on the left side, now let me go back here. Um, so this is a technical thing here on the left. You see the symbol on the left um, uh, corner top. Die wahre Religion, this is part of uh, the, the uh, symbol that is banned. You have uh, on the left side here again, uh, the symbol of the organization, you have this lease, which, which means read as part of their core propaganda activity. And then you see in the middle column, videos that we have reported uh, under NetsDG, and those uh, videos were blocked after we reported them. But on the right side, as you can see, there are videos that show the same uh, symbols, logos, and they were not uh, blocked. So we, we didn't understand how that is possible because the content of the videos was almost uh, identical. The, the symbols were clearly identifiable, but uh, YouTube said, this is illegal. The other, uh, we don't see a problem. Another uh, case here on the left side, you see a video of the key recruiter, the head of the organization, um, educating uh, the public on issues blocked after CEP gave notice. On the other side, there's another upload of the same video that is still online up to today, despite the fact that we've been in month long conversations also with YouTube. So it seems really the notice and takedown means that only if we make YouTube aware and not even then, I mean, that was the first part of the research, but the argument is we only know what we see. On Facebook, we have uh, the situation that there were folders in a profile of that head of that organization, that band organization, showing their recruiting activities. And what we did is we, um, out of, for example, you see here a couple of pictures, a lot of them show uh, that band logo. So we reported two of those and Facebook said immediately, of course, this is illegal, we're taking it down. But they only took down the two we reported. So the rest stayed there. So Facebook basically said the the law mandates us to take down what you report to us, but what you don't report to us, we don't see. But it was the same folder as you can see here. And there were 400 more pictures like this, videos and all. Um, the video, uh, the profile here with all that illegal content um, disappeared after we published um, our uh, report. And also YouTube um, asked us uh, since they were um, not very happy with our findings, as you can imagine, to provide them with a full data set of all the data we have on our research. We did so, and uh, they came back to us after a few weeks saying, well, your research was 100% correct, and there might be an issue with our compliance system, and we're checking it. So this is uh, definitely something worth looking into, because the whole EU legislation that was uh, discussed before is based on that mechanism. Notice and action, or notice and takedown. Um, and our research indicates that there's a problem with that. Does it work? As I mentioned, um, we're not convinced. Even if it would work, the whole system of keeping the internet clear of terrorist content would then still be based on trust and chance. Trust that the companies do what they can do 
And this is not about good or bad behavior. This is just about allocating resources. Um, so we would trust the companies to do the best they can and chance that a user like you and I would uh, find something and report it. Um, and then, of course, there's the IRUs, the Internet Referral Units that were mentioned before. We have such a thing in Germany, of course, as well. Um, but these are just a couple of police officers, right? So the conclusion here is that there's no effective, systematic, and continuous monitoring of the platforms covered by the NetsDG in relation to violations of the German law. It is really basically on the companies look for stuff, of course. If they find it, they take care of it. If it's being reported, they sometimes take care of it, sometimes not. So this means that um, unfound or unnoticed content uh, can remain online in large quantities. And this leads to a really interesting point, two contradicting truths. So we need to understand better what is actually happening. Uh, Roderick was mentioning this. We don't really understand what the platforms are doing because the current transparency reports do not necessarily lead to transparency. Um, we need to understand the processes to apply technologies, and I'll say a little bit about this in a minute. Um, it is, is very relevant for the upcoming regulations on the EU level, because at the moment, since the companies themselves decide what they can see, meaning what they look for and how they look for it, and then what is being removed and not, um, and they don't have to be fully transparent about it, we really don't know what actually is online in terms of illegal content. And so the companies could claim that they remove 99.9% .9 of illegal content, meaning the one, the part that has been reported to them and the part that they found, while their platform could be full of illegal content that simply nobody reported and they haven't looked for. So this raises some doubts regarding the constant success stories that are being shared with the public. Um, another hot topic is, of course, the automated decision-making systems, which also was addressed before. Um, this is not about if, but how, right? So we, we heard about how long it takes to um, identify the content that's being uploaded, um, if it's illegal or not. Uh, YouTube loads up 720,000 hours of video content per day, a billion posts on Facebook with uh, 300 million images, Everything right now is being filtered, recommended, structured, uh, and, and other processed ways to show you stuff online, right? There is no uh, free internet in that regard. It is all pre-structured. So what we are talking about is how to deal with that. And pro proactive technology is being used and is necessary due to the sheer amount, if we like it or not. Um, and even in the field of terrorist content, uh, companies are openly saying that they're using upload and re-upload filters. Um, also in other uh, fields where it could be um, unwanted content, not just illegal content. Um, and this is why um, um, the companies say we use technology, image uh, recognition, logo recognition sometimes, but again, we don't know exactly what is going on. And this leads to some recommendations here. Um, there's an EU expert, uh, high-level expert group that gave out ethics guidelines for trustworthy artificial intelligence, and they highlight the importance of transparency and especially explainability of the automated systems if they have significant impact on people's lives. And I think everybody agrees that social media and other platforms have an impact on our lives. So to make social media safer, um, we need to understand better what the companies are doing. We need to move out and uh, from this um, looking at the companies or the industry as these wonder childs, wonder kinder uh, from 20 years ago. And Roderick, I think, uh, did a great job of highlighting the history uh, where we came from, where it was an, um, an all carrots, no sticks uh, environment. But now these are major industries. Uh, some are as big as the biggest chemical industry companies or pharma industry companies, but they're still regulated like, you know, kids, like startups, but they are not. So we just ask um, for proper uh, systems of compliance and transparency here. And of course, transparency can be misused. So we suggest a two-tier system 
to make sure that the policymakers and public know what's necessary, but then again, the transparency cannot be misused. And we have a policy brief published on that. It was part of the invitation. It will be uploaded on our website uh, soon. And if you don't have it, but want it, please send us an email and we'll send it to you if you need it urgently. Where we go beyond the transparency talk, right? Transparency is the new sustainability. Everybody kind of likes it. Nobody really knows what it is, what you use it for. So we need to go into the nitty gritty part of what exactly do we need to know so the companies can then uh, provide us with the information so we can make informed decision on the issue. So second recommendation coming to an end, proactive search. As I said, a system that is based on trust and chance cannot succeed. Um, achieving making, if the objective is to make the internet a safer place in terms of terrorist content online, uh, that is a somewhat clearly defined uh, uh, area of operation, right? There's always discussion, but this might be the best defined area that we have. We need systematic and continuous um, um, uh, search here. And this cannot be left to the companies and a couple of uh, police uh, um, um, policemen, police women. We need third parties, civil society organizations and others should be commissioned and financed to really help to make the internet a safer place. So some colleague asked me, why is this necessary? Like in the real world in offline, we don't have civil society patrolling the streets or checking up on what people are doing. That is true. And I wouldn't want to live in a world like that. But right now, in the European Union, the estimate it is about 450 police officers going after terrorist content online in a web for 450 million EU citizens. Right? Just the numbers are ridiculous and outrageous. There's no, um, 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 there's, it is really out of balance and we just need to step up our game here. So the final point, upload filters, yes, they are operating all day, every day. Everything you see is being filtered, recommended, and otherwise structured. Um, so the reservations are still understandable because we need to understand, and, and Roderick mentioned that, why is stuff being filtered? What's the, the rationale behind it? Uh, what's the objective behind it? Um, but the fact is, it is happening. So it's not about if we should have upload filters. It's about how to use them. And here we need the transparency, the explainability um, that could lead also for us assessing the effectiveness. And if we have that explainability of what the companies are doing, civil liberties will be protected more with regulation than without regulation as it is right now. Thank you.